So thank you for coming to United We Win, Lessons Learned from Collaboration and Co-working Around the World. Please welcome Ichiro Lam from Dejavan Games. Uh, my name is Ichiro Lam. I run an indie studio called Dejoban Games. Today I am going to be talking about community, things that community can do for you, the way communities develop over time, the way they evolve, and a couple of lessons about co-working and collaboration. So why don't I step right in and talk a little bit about what uh, I've done research on here. Uh, I know the Boston community fairly well but I actually don't know much about other communities across the world. So as preparation for this talk, what I did was I talked to about 20 community leaders and prominent members of communities around the world, and I talked to people in about 12 different locations. Uh, on the West Coast, we have Vancouver, Victoria, San Fran. I don't think I got anybody from Seattle. On the East Coast, we have Montreal, Boston. We got some Philly love, where's Tim? Uh, and then in the middle of all of this uh, is a wonderful community in Austin. I also hopped the pond and talked to a couple of people from London and Utrecht. And of course, there's always the internet, which I don't know where it lives, but it lives somewhere here. The takeaways, uh, I guess, are fourfold. I wanted to get sort of an idea for who is in the audience. So can you give me a show of hands of who's an indie developer? Okay, that's like 99% of the audience. Uh, any community leaders? Okay, that's actually a good percentage of the audience. Anybody not in a community? Good, like if you're like sitting on an island by yourself, that would be you. All right, so this talk is for you. And then uh, publishers, platform holders, hardware folks, uh, people who might benefit from working with these communities. So the takeaways that I want to uh, give are fourfold. People who are not involved in communities, and maybe I'll talk a little bit less about that since there are only three of you, and I'm going to set all three of you up with friends by the end of this. Um, I'd like to tell you guys what's out there, how to form a group if you want one, how to find one. Uh, community members who are part of, for example, the Boston community might hear about how wonderful Huevos Rancheros, Juegos Rancheros is in their artistic focus in games and want to go visit Austin for a week. And similarly, somebody from Seattle who is interested in Boston's entrepreneurial bent might be interested in visit visiting us for a week. Community leaders, people who start communities or have started communities, prominent members, are actually really knowledgeable about the communities that they serve and have formed but kind of know jack all about other communities in the world. And this is a broad sweeping generalization. And if that's not true of you, please don't take that personally. But time and again, when I ask a community leader, hey, you know, you're doing the community in Saskatchewan. Can you tell me the uh, community in Nova Scotia, uh, what, what's going on there? They will apologetically say, oh, well, I know some great stuff is coming out of there, but I don't know exactly who's doing it or what's coming out of there. So hopefully I'll uh, get some of you guys to mix with each other and, and talk to each other and learn from each other. And finally, if you are a publisher or a platform holder, if you create hardware, you uh, will learn a little bit about how to interface with these groups. The roadmap is four steps. First, I'm gonna talk about Boston as an example community. Being from New England, that's the one that I know best. Uh, I'd like to talk about the genesis of groups and how they evolve over time from two members to 20 to 200 to sometimes 20,000. I'd like to talk about what happens after those groups get really, really big and form splinters and spin-offs. And then I'd like to focus in a little bit about curated groups and co-working spaces. There's probably gonna be time for Q&A after, but uh, we'll see. So let's take a look at Boston. Boston is about 600,000 people, maybe a million in the surrounding area, or many millions in the surrounding greater Boston area. There are a number of universities, Harvard, MIT, Northeastern, etc. Uh, it has a storied game development history. People who know Infocom and Looking Glass, uh, dearly departed, know that they are from Cambridge, Massachusetts, right next to Boston. 
And presently, happily, we have a number of AAA studios in the area from, for example, Turbine, Harmonix, Irrational, Rockstar New England isn't too far away. And there are a handful of successful independent game development studios from the tiny one-person studio who's making a living creating games, perhaps on mobile, to 12-person studios, to 50-person studios, sort of mid-size. The most important thing, of course, out of all of this is that communities are breeding successful games. So let's do a spotlight on Boston. What's going on in my hometown? The however many thousands of people who are peripherally interested in developing games, I think we're up to like uh, three or 5,000 on our mailing list for our local IGDA chapter come to a group called Boston Indies every month. I'm sorry, Boston Postmortem every month. That's this top one, IGDA Boston. Uh, and this is a very general purpose group. It is open. It's for everybody, AAA, indie, hobbyists, students, people who are educators, people who have nothing to do with game development, but are interested in the process may come to this and be welcome. And therefore, the talks are general purpose. So they're going to be, for instance, what's going on in the industry. Somebody from a AAA studio locally may give a talk about a postmortem for a project that they just completed. The community is large enough to have a number of uh, spin-off groups, the most near and dear to my heart being Boston Indies and the Boston Indie Game Collective. And I don't know, is Michael there? Michael Carrier is sort of like the, um, he is the indie maestro of Boston, having um, founded the Indie Game Collective, which is a co-working space I'll talk about, and heading up, uh, co-heading right now, Boston Indies. Boston Indies is a group of, what are we at, like 500 members on the mailing list right now. It is a monthly event that meets very regularly. Uh, I think, in fact, we have met every single month since its inception, uh, except for that one month where my city was bombed and we figured it was like a good week maybe not to do it. Um, that consistency, of course, is key. And the organization will include events like demo nights or talks about you know, steam pipe, or uh, for example, postmortems similar to the IGDA group, but maybe specific to us indie development studios. The Indie Game Collective is about a dozen to 15 people right now, and those are all full-time game developers living under one roof. And Boston is large enough to include a number of special interest groups. Boston Unity Group, which is co-founded, co-led by Elliot Mitchell, who is sitting in row number two. That tackles issues with Unity 3D, surprisingly enough. The MIT Game Circle, being MIT-focused, is, um, is an entrepreneurship program. It is out of their, uh, what is it called, their, um, no, it's blanking on that. Um, Enterprise Forum, thank you, sir. Uh, Women in Games Boston deals with sexism and the growing uh, gender diversity in our industry. And there are certain things like Game Over, which are weekly public-facing events. So what happens in Game Over is in Harvard Square, if you're familiar with the area, and I'm feeling all the pops and cracks of my talking. It's kind of grossing me out, so I'm sorry about that. But Game Over uh, is a group where you'll see a bunch of Nintendos and a bunch of uh, Dreamcasts and so forth in a bar, and the general public will come in and play all of these games, and they'll play a bunch of board games, and they'll get together and have a lot of fun. Uh, in fact, I think we should bring a Steam box to that and see what people have to say about that. But all of these and more, they're academic groups. There's something uh, you might have heard of called PAX East, which happens every year, and that's right in Boston. And there are other groups as well. So that's just one city. That's a one city that's sort of a small city. It's like, I think, the 21st largest in the United States. So imagine what else is out there. We have Juegos Rancheros in Austin. We have Level Up out of Victoria. We have the Mount Royale Game Society in Montreal. We have Full Indie in Vancouver. Philly has the Dev Night. Toronto has the Hand Eye Society. Seattle, London, Utrecht, Tokyo. And of course, uh, the internet has a bunch of groups for themselves. <laughs> and 
I would actually like to try an experiment. I feel like every speaker has one of these available to them in their uh, speaker lifetime. What I would like you to do is take a look, uh, maybe not to your left and to the right because you know everybody, but look behind you, look in front of you. I'd like you to briefly introduce yourself to somebody and to tell them who you are, what company you come from, uh, And I want you to tell them what community you're part of. Rummy, nice to meet you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I timed it. And there were, there were lots of laughs because I know you're sitting with your colleagues and your friends, but it took you 56.27 seconds to form a community. And hopefully you know a bunch of other people. Yes, please applaud yourselves. A new community forming. Uh, and when you see these other people in the hallway, smile and wink. And if you can be a little saucy about it, please do that as well. <laughs> My point to this is that devs are gregarious, right? People love to talk to each other, although there's sort of a barrier between them. Uh, communities, geographically based communities, tend to break these down. There are a bazillion of these. Right? I mean, here we had, oops, no, not that one. But like, I mean, look at all these. These are just some of the ones that I talked to. I just love this slide. <laughs> uh, imagine how many there are in the world. So let me talk about how they begin, how they don't begin, and a couple of lessons we learned from there. So part two of the talk. In the beginning, a solo developer's train of thought starts, I really love making games. Holy crap, I'm going insane doing it myself. Wouldn't it be nice to be able to do it with somebody else? So the genesis of a group is oftentimes very casual. It starts in a cafe or a bar in part because people like to drink and space is cheap or free. Sometimes this uh, community that stems from these is hard won. So Andy Moore, who founded Level Up in Victoria, did so because he went to groups like GDC and whatever else uh, you know, was, was happening at a particular given time. And he would talk to other developers, and he would ask them, hey, where are you from? And they would respond, well, you wouldn't know the place. It's something called Victoria. And he's like, I'm from Victoria. Why don't, you, why don't we get all together? And so when he got back from GDC, he emailed everybody. And he and his friend went to a bar. And they sat there, and they waited and waited, and nobody else came. But he was persistent. So he went the second week, and he and his friend had a bunch of drinks, and they waited and waited, and nobody came. They went the third week, and then they went the fourth week, and it was just them, and it was looking bleak. But the fifth week, a third person came. <laughs> and then a fifth person, and then a tenth person, and then a fiftieth person, and eventually he had a community around him, a group that met regularly for the purpose of discussing indie game development. Now, the flip side is that sometimes people form a catalyst for a group's formation. Full Indie, Vancouver, Jake Burkett and Alex Vostrov started a group thinking, well, you know, if we go meet in a bar, maybe we could get five people, maybe six if we're really, really lucky. Well, they go to the bar and 50 people show up, and boom, that was a group of developers in his community that was just waiting for something to happen. Now, what's really important, lesson number one about all of this, is that you got to remember to start a community. We'll go back to Andy's example, or an example of Andy. I think he went across all of Canada from town to town and talked about game development. And he came to this village of 400 people, and there was, a, there was a game developer there, one game developer that said, God, I really, really wish there was a group around me. And sure enough, with work and persistence, this guy got four game developers to show up at an event, which doesn't sound like a lot, but in a community, a village of 400 people, that's like 1% of the entire city is game developers. <laughs> so you got to start somewhere. And consistency is key once you've already started. I think uh, an example that was given to me while I was talking to people was Brazil, where there are lots of individual game developers, indie game developers, just sort of waiting, right? 
And I think it's only relatively recently that something has sparked because only recently has that been that really consistent event that happens from week to week or month to month. So you schedule an event in advance and you say, okay, I'm gonna go and we're all gonna meet at a bar and we're gonna talk about a postmortem for Half-Life 2 or Portal 1 or whatever you're talking about if you're Valve. And you gotta do that every month or every week or however often that you wanna do that. Uh, because if you don't do that, developers start getting confused and they fall apart. And I see a lot of nods from the Brazil crowd, is that correct? Yes. Are, you, are you starting to see that a little more? Yeah, we're, we're getting consistency. Yeah. Just very recently. Yep. Yeah. There you go. I am not lying to you here. You can believe everything that I say. <laughs> Eventually a group crawls to double digits. So you have a community of 20 or 40 or 80 people these are generally going to be focused on game development process. So if there are maybe 50 game developers in an area and you have a meetup which brings 30 people every week or every month, most of those are probably going to be game developers, right? Boston Indies, our own group, circa 2011, was a few dozen people and most of them were independent game developers. Some of them were hobbyists or people just peripherally interested in games, but by and large it was the people who would bring their works in progress for you to rag on and to rip apart and bring together again. Full Indie UK, I believe, is uh, a curated group. They have 80 members right now, of which maybe 40 members meet at a given time. And uh, it's a group of people who specifically are creating or have created games and they are, you know, the discourse is pretty high there as a result of that. An interesting aspect of it is that they are a movable group, if I understand correctly, Jake. They go from um, Brighton to Birmingham to maybe London to whatever, wherever. And I sort of have this, uh, I I this idea in mind of this indie steam locomotive system where there's like game jam car and here's the, you know, the, here's the unity car and here's whatever. Uh, I don't know if that's true or not. I'd prefer not to be disavowed of that image if it's not true. But even if you don't have, it's not true, okay, thanks. <laughs> even if you don't have that, it's really, really cool, and you get this small town feel. You're gonna have a bunch of developers who all know each other, who wanna be respectful to each other and want to help each other out. You will attend barbecues rather than starting flame wars with each other. And there's this radical openness amongst the community. So I might tell you, because I know you, my sales figures or things that I've been working on that I might not be announcing to the public or problems that I've been having or successes or who to talk to at Valve or what have you. And the more this happens, the greater your community will evolve in, into, assuming that it's an open one. And eventually you get to hundreds and thousands or tens of thousands or however many. <laughs> Rami is from the internet, and therefore is familiar with communities of tens of thousands. Uh, the more open a group is, the more general an audience is going to be. I mean, there are only so many game developers, but there are many, many people who might want to be game developers or are just interested in educating future game developers. That means that the larger that your group grows, the smaller a percentage, perhaps, if it's open, of game developers you're gonna have, people who make a living off of game development. So instead of having 30 full-time game developers, you now have 30 full-time game developers, 20 educators, 20 more students, and 10 hobbyists and, and maybe a press member or somebody random. This is really great for everybody. You got new voices, people giving you new information, new ideas, things are caught uh, out of the news and you know, brought up in a, in a particular meeting. You have many, many people testing, so instead of those 20 game developers or however many, you have those game developers plus all of the fans, plus all of the educators saying, oh, you're doing this right, you're not doing that right. You got a lot of opinions going on, and by and large, when you get to this group size, you have a lot of cheerleaders, which is great because you got people saying, my God, I really love the prototype that you brought in last week. 
Maybe there's some things that you can improve about it, but I'm really gunning for you. And that's a refreshing change from like back to the internet where there's sort of unmitigated hate and flame. And if you've, you know, like on Steam Greenlight, why would you even do this game? I hate you. <laughs> it's gonna get in the way. On the other hand, if I hide it, I'm gonna get kicked out of the talk, but that's fine. You guys can come with me. We're a community. <laughs> there are a number of downsides of this, though, to the serious, they call themselves, game developers. This is a completely new group of people, and cliques tend to form. So, <laughs> oh my god, don't talk to Rami. Um, <laughs> okay, don't talk to Rami. Uh, seriously, we get groups of people who might say, don't talk to Rami, he is too successful, he won't want to talk to you, he doesn't have the same problems that I do, we're just hobby game developers, he's making bazillions, don't talk to him. Uh, we have things like waiting lists, and I wonder, okay, uh, you know, once a community gets past a certain size, you have a bunch of people left out of it, and for those core game developers who are doing it day in, day out, as their full-time 80-hour-a-week job, the signal-to-noise ratio may go down. Discourse is going to become general. So instead of talking about, say, uh, Unity rendering pipeline in Unity 4.4.6 beta 6, you're going to be talking about what's coming in the next year in the Boston scene or a post-mortem of a game in the Philly scene. And that's okay, that's really important. But you kind of miss out on some of the, the more specific stuff that's important to you in day to day. There is a shift from, uh, you know, from being the group to being mentors of the group. So for example, in New England, there's a group called Mass Digi, which brings a bunch of mentors together and those mentors who have been in the industry for a number of years get together with small student teams or small hobbyist teams, and they listen to game ideas, and they tear them apart, and they put them back together, and when everybody's done crying, they have a better idea of how to make a, a saleable game. These communities are also really good for their members. Um, well, they shift in that members can start cross-promoting for each other. So, for example, there's a game called Cat Lateral Damage. Has anybody have heard of it? Yeah. Okay. Basically, uh, a member of the Boston community thought, well, I own a cat, and the cat knocks everything off of everything I own. Why don't I make a game out of this? So you go and you jump up onto tables, and you hit the right mouse button, the right left mouse button, and everything gets knocked to the floor, and you get points. Great. Well, the community loves this. They're going to cross-promote that. They're going to tweet about it. They're going to talk about it to local press. They're going to talk about it on Facebook. And so cross-promotion is a really great thing. So this shift happens. There are some good things. There are some bad things. But I think, by and large, when we start getting general again, we start seeing a shift. Uh, sorry, we start seeing spin-offs. So what, is, what seems really healthy uh, I think, and this is just gauging from, uh, from talking to, to people around the world, is you know, single and double digit groups seem to gain that hometown feel again, right? Uh, and again, you can splinter off into social issues groups or you can do something like the Boston Unities group and talk about tech. Uh, very popular are groups that are business focused. So, you know, if you are sitting there and you are trying to get into the IGF, well, who do you want to talk to is other IGF winners. Secret societies, which I will not talk about because I'm pretty sure I'd be killed. <laughs> but everybody is part, everybody here is part of one or more secret societies. It's an open secret. You're not part of the same secret societies. I just saw Zoe, you just did sort of like a, like a thing there. That was a secret handshake that's gonna be on YouTube now. Uh, but I think the more open version of this is the curated group. So as I mentioned, if you have similar objectives in business or art, you're going to want to find people who are like you. If your objective for 2014 is to make $5 million and win every single award in the IGF, you are going to want to meet people who have made 
they're living in games. You're going to want to meet people who have won the IGF. And it doesn't have to just be about business. If you're artistically inclined, you are going to want to meet people who are really serious about games as art. Uh, a really, really micro example, I like to talk to this gentleman here, Dean Tate, who was a former harmonics lead designer for many of the games you and I both know and love. This is really useful to us because we meet on a very regular basis and we talk about things. I talk about business and being an indie. He talks about design and how to make games good. I talk to him about not going out of business and he talks to me about making games where the design doesn't suck. And that's really useful. It's a very, very small, very focused thing. As I mentioned before, Full Indie UK is another example. 80 members, all of them, correct me if I'm wrong, working on a game, have worked on a game, accomplished people, very serious about their craft. And therefore, they're going to have the same problems. They're going to have connections to other people that make sense for other members. How am I doing on time? We got lots of time, it's 27 past. We can take a smoke break if you want. I think recently in Vogue have become co-working spaces among game development communities. So you have things like the Philly Game Forge or say the Boston Indies community, uh, Boston um, Indie Game Collective. I started independent games at Dejabon in 1999, back before I think the internet existed. And I had pretty much been working out of one home office or another until 2012. So I had been developing games, releasing games, making money on games, and I'd been working with teams, but every single day I would get out of bed, sometimes I would put pants on, and I would go to my computer and I would work there. It was in, I think, late 2012 that Michael Carrier put together the Indie Game Collective. That is 12 indies under one roof in Kendall Square. The group was curated, so full-time, accomplished, diverse people. So people whom Michael said had something to lose if they failed at video game development. If I fail at video game development, I can't pay my mortgage and therefore I'm going to be kicked out of Boston. I'm going to have to live in a box on the internet somewhere. Accomplished people, people who have for example, won critical or commercial acclaim, uh, you know, IGF nominees, honorable mentions, winners, and so forth and so on. People of diverse skills, people who are like Dave, who's a musician, he plays the banjo, or Trevor, who used to work from AAA. And the benefits of this are multifold. I would say that the first thing that I hear when I talk about working from home from anybody is, oh my God, I could not imagine doing that because I would spend my entire time watching TV or washing the cat or, you know, watching the cat wash TV or whatever permutation of that exists. Uh, working in a co-working space, as you might imagine, provides a little bit of a focus. So you probably can't surf Facebook or, you know, Pornhub all day if you're at an, at an office. You probably can't do laundry all afternoon if you work in an office. You, you know, something is going to bring you back to work. There are a number of shared resources, small no-brainer things like printers, right? You have an office printer, you can have the best printer in the world, and you share that cost among 50 billion people, and the, you know, the per person cost is going to be a cent, I exaggerate. Uh, and then you could do things like building a VO booth, right? This is in part why being part of a game development co-working space is useful, because if you are working with an accountant and maybe uh, you know software as a service and maybe a, you know a third person that makes widgets, they're not going to be interested in creating a VO booth. But if you are working with other game developers, you're going to want to build one. There's also a lot of cross-pollination that happens at this level. So you are sitting next to people who day after day are trying to solve almost exactly the same problems as you are, right? At a large company, you might be in a group of people working on graphics, or you might be in a group of people working on marketing or whatever. But in a co-working indie space, most everybody is running a tiny business and trying to stay alive and make their five bazillion dollars or what have you. A couple of examples of this out of the Philly Game Forge. How many of you guys have heard of, let's see, uh, these hot, wait, these french fries make terrible hot dogs. Show of hands. 
Anybody? Has anybody backed that Kickstarter? Okay. Uh, it is a card game that sprung from a game jam, if I, if I recall correctly. And Sean Pierre of the Philly area said, you know, I'm just going to create this card game and see if it's any interesting, uh, you know, it's, it's any interest to anybody. So he put it together and people played it and said, my God, that's really interesting. And because he know, knew Will Stallwood, who is a graphics artist, he was able to say, hey, Will, you're sitting 20 feet from me. Why don't you do the art for the cards? And since he knew the entire community, he was able to film the, the Kickstarter trailer, which I believe was aimed at getting $4,000 and ended up getting $20,000, which is pretty good for a hard game, uh, uh, hard card? Card game about freaking hot dogs. Uh, you know, another example maybe in the video game area is uh, our own Elegy for a Dead World. I work with a group of 11 other people in the Indie Game Collective, and we're working on a couple of games. Drop that beat like an ugly baby, drunken robot pornography, and these games are really overdue, and I needed a break from them. So for a week, I said to a colleague, I said, you know what, let's just drop everything that we're doing, get together, and create something. And if it works out, we'll go to Valve and we'll say, you know, can we put you on, can, can, we, can you put this on Steam? And if it doesn't, no big whoop. So we got together and sat down, and I actually always thought game development was going to be like this. We had a table, a bunch of paper and colored pencils, right? That's, that's the way game development is supposed to be. And we created this game. Over the course of a week, we prototyped this game. And we said, wow, this is really, really good. This is completely different from what we're used to doing. I do first-person shooters. I do games like, ah, which is about jumping off of a building, right? Action, action game. Uh, Drunken Robot Pornography is a first-person bullet hell shooter where you're trying to destroy 30-story tall robots. Elegy for a Dead World is a game where you explore long-dead civilizations based on the works of long-dead British Romance-era poets, and you write about them. Completely different, right? And I would never have thought of all of this, or never have taken it in the direction that we did, if it weren't for cross-pollinating with people that I've sat next to, day in, day out. Um, and let me give a more general uh, example to cap this off, if I can convince any of you guys to work at co-working spaces. When we work at the Indie Game Collective, we see half a dozen launches in a year. We see IGF honorable mentions and hopefully you know, nominations and wins. We see hundreds of press releases going out. We see dozens of articles. We see the game development process from beginning to middle, to end, and post-launch. Hello, Keith. You're late. <laughs> and we see that many, many times over. Think about it back here, and I think I have a laser pointer, which doesn't show anything because it's there, right? Uh, first line, from 1999 to 2012, every year, on average, I would see one launch, and I would have to figure it out myself or talk to somebody on the internet. So I think co-working spaces are pretty neat. And if anybody here is at all interested in working at a co-working space or starting a co-working space, I would actually not ask some random person. Talk to somebody who had started one, Michael Carrier, the guy in the plaid shirt. He's got this fantastic beard on him. Congratulations, <laughs> sir. <laughs> Typically, I think uh, in the Boston area, and maybe outside the Boston area on the low end, inside the Boston area on the high end, we're going to see something like $100 for a part-time uh, you know, moving desk to $500 or $600 for a permanent desk per month. Uh, has anybody here started a space aside from Michael? Yeah, we have one in Bristol called Bristol Games. We're up to about 135 developers now. Look at that gentleman. See, notice this gentleman and talk to him at the end. Anybody else? Bristol Games Hub, yes? Uh, Glitch City, LA. All right, Glitch City, LA. Perfect example, right? Um, Indie Game Collective has 15 people. Philly Game Forge has 18 people. Talk to Will Stallwood of Cypher Prime. Dutch Game Garden, 43 people. 
JP over there is really rocking it. And there are a couple of corollary benefits to these. I find that it's actually much easier to interact with companies and large organizations as cohesive groups like this. So here's a picture of, I think we're talking to our counselor at large, Leland Chung, and this is um, a who's who of the Indie Game Collective at the time. Government entities know how to talk to groups. They don't know how to talk to individual indie developers. Valve is actually really good at reaching out to indies, but they're better at reaching out to groups. So for example, at PAX East last year, since we talked to Valve a great deal, when they came out, they were able to talk to us. They were able to meet with us, and we had lunch with them, and we talked about our problems and our hopes and what's happening with you know, Greenlight and uh, you know, Steam Pipe and so forth and so on. Since I keep pestering Anna Sweet, uh, also of Valve fame, with pictures of our lovely co-working space, which is that, she knew that we had a number of independent developers in the area, and when she and the Alienware folks and DJ Powers did their tour to talk about Steam Machines, she said, oh, Ichiro, you're in Boston. Who else is at your co-working space and who else is around the area? Let's meet and let's present to you about this. Let's get you guys a Steam box. And that's something that can happen because we have this big cohesive group. Uh, one problem that I'm finding, however, is that, as I mentioned, all of these groups talk within, each, you know, within themselves. So if I know something, you guys will know something. However, I think there's room for these communities to talk about themselves a little more. They should talk to other community leaders. They should talk to government, as they sometimes do. They should talk more to these companies like Valve and Intel, Microsoft, Sony, so that they have something to, somebody to talk to in return. So if you have a community where a handful of games sort of substantiates that community, like you know you have a bunch of talented people and some of them have a game that does well on a particular platform, well, that platform holder is probably going to want to talk to the entire group. And communities, as I may have mentioned, are actually, I don't want to, I don't want to be negative, but they're, they're really bad at talking to each other about themselves. They're sort of more selfless rather than selfish about it. So I can go to a random community leader and say, tell me about you know, this other community, and, and, and they might not know as much as they should. I did 10, Is that, are you rating me? Because I, mean, I look great, fabulous. Uh, 10 minutes, okay, I gotta get out of here in 10 minutes. We'll go and we'll all have a, a bite to eat. So really briefly, the way that we can do this, or one way that we can do this, is through what we call the quarterly touch. Dejaban, I think, does this very well. Every quarter, or less, if we happen to have a crunch period and we have to delay it, we put together a bullet point list, you know, nice, glossy with graphics, about everything that my studio is doing, every really, really high point stuff. Oh, we got this honorable mention in the IGF. Oh, we got placement here. We did, you know, we have the one, number one uh, downloaded Oculus game on the Oculus share site, whatever. And then we send that out to companies and to members of the community. And as a result, they know that we exist. I would wonder, I wonder, if communities could do this a little more and talk to companies and talk to other communities and see if they can get more information through to each other. Because I would love to learn more about Juegos Rancheros because they sound amazing. And one thing I find about them and almost everybody else I've spoken with is that People are, are passionate about what they do, they're passionate about their communities, and they're willing to sit on Skype with me for an hour talking about their community, and it's fascinating. So I'd like to see more of this, maybe through a quarterly touch, maybe through whatever. Uh, I'm going to ask you to grab me a microphone, and we'll take Kelly and Rami, not at the same time. What I wanted to do is this. Here are two people who have done a pretty good survey of communities around the world. Kelly Wallach of the Indie Mega Booth uh, represents the number one largest booth at PAX, 
This is what? How many hundreds of developers? Like 100 devs or 100 games? Is this on? Okay. Yeah, it's on. Uh, yep. Uh, I guess I think total we've worked with like 150 to 200 companies. Okay. So and they're from outside, you know, all over the world, right? Yeah. So what I would like you to do, actually, I'm going to interview. If you would come up here kindly and spend three minutes telling me, since you've been touring the world, having fun, drinking, eating, yeah. leaving Boston. Oh, geez. Tell me three things that you found interesting about communities around the world. Um, let's see. So I think um, there's a really big distinction between um, US and European communities, uh, mostly based on um, academic and government grants and what that means for the developers and how they're learning to survive within those communities. So in the US, I think that the communities need to focus on um, helping each other and tend to be more um, business focused in a sense because they have to be because they can't bring in um, money or support otherwise. So like if you're not going to be talking to other developers and to companies and things like that or trying to get onto a platform or whatever, uh, you're basically going to sink because there's no other way to bring in money or resources. Uh, European developers and European communities tend to have a lot of academic ties and money coming in for gov like government grants and things like that. So it's actually sort of it's interesting because you can be a little bit more artistic and you have a lot more freedom and you have the support from like these internal infrastructures that are already there for you. But then you also have like a little bit of a break on moving out to becoming uh, consumer facing because you don't have to because you, you don't ever really need to pursue that. So there's um, there's sort of a difference um, between that as well. And it also is based on the size and like the type of like games and stuff that people are going to be interested in making. Um, the other thing then is too is that I think that like you were saying like a lot of the communities don't really discuss all this stuff with each other and the mega booth at least like we have people globally and locally and everything too and it's a good way to connect other developers to each other and they find out that they have a lot more in common than they thought that they did and that people are like going through the same struggles and trying to do the same things as well so it's sort of like you're not really as far away from all of these other communities as you think that you are I guess. Um, I think that's only two things but that's fine. Hey that's perfect yeah. thank you very much. <laughs> hey. uh, let me pull up. Please. Let me pull Rami up. Uh, Rami Ismail, founder of Vlambeer, uh, a gentleman who tours the entire universe, including the internet. Can you give me, let's see, how much time do we got? Oh, five minutes. All right, Rami, three minutes. Give me three of your top three. most important points. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to agree with Kelly on both of those points. I think Europe is a completely different environment than the U.S. It's, it has a lot of it has a lot of government structure. I do think that a lot of the larger communities in Europe are still commercially focused. Something like the Dutch Game Garden is is actually a business center slash incubator and fulfills both of those roles. Where something like Copenhagen, for example, all of the people in the Copenhagen community tend to come from MIT, uh, not MIT, sorry, uh, the Copenhagen Univers uh, University. Um, I think one of the interesting things I found is that a, a lot of communities, even within a country, tend to be really, really different. Something like Boston is completely different from something like LA, where LA has a bunch of more fragmented communities that are starting to like come closer together, while Boston has this really interesting mix of people just starting out as indies, and then also people coming from like universities or schools or from AAA studios joining indie from that. So the way communities grow seem to be really unique to, to every location and I think that is actually a really valuable thing because that also means that the perspectives that each community has can help other communities grow if only they would get in touch and I think one of the most interesting examples of that is actually in the more emerging territories, something like uh, Brazil for example but also um, South Africa which I also visited uh, earlier this year and some of the, the um, Asian countries they have a really sort of new type of community that they're building and they're they're trying to get visibility on a global scale through that and that is a problem that we haven't faced in in Europe or America because we've always had that visibility just from being in this territory and I think seeing what those communities are going to do is going to be one of the more interesting developments of this in the next year. All right, thank you sir, Rami. What, what happens if I speak into both of these? Um, I am out of time. I have like three seconds left. Um, does that include, do I have time for QA? Yes? One or two questions. Or two questions. Um, why don't we start with one question? Oh, sorry, I'll give you the microphone back. Uh, question, question, sir. 
I just have a real quick question. I'm new to Seattle, but um, I was wondering if there's any co-working spaces in Seattle, if anyone knows. Yep, uh, talk to John Krievsky, I think. Uh, talk to that gentleman at the end. He will say yes, and he will tell you where to do. Um, can I get a uh, show of hands again who's a community leader? I would like you to all stand up and go to the back of the room. <laughs> Just stand up, go to the back of the room. Man, you guys look so sad. I'm not going to shoot you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to celebrate you here. Uh, if you guys would like to chat with me, here I am at Chiro Dejaban. I am at Dejaban.com. I usually have a beard and horns. These men and women are the people who lead or are prominent members of their communities. What I would like to happen, instead of my standing up in here and adding, as, answering one question after another, is I would like you guys to go and to talk to these people, and just as importantly, I would like you guys to talk to each other, especially if you don't know each other. So that's pretty much all I have to say. I would like to thank all of you very much, especially everybody.